Good evening, everyone. Welcome to New Life Church. I'm Pastor Larry, and I am just excited to have another opportunity to preach from the book of Exodus. Uh, the book of Exodus is one of my favorite books in the Bible, and uh, you can learn a lot from the life and ministry of Moses. He went through the highs, he went through the lows. And we're going to read about uh, one of the lows today as we go into chapter 2 in the book of Exodus, because as great of a man as Moses was, he experienced something that you and I experience all the time. Failure. Sometimes when things don't go our way, when we face a defeat, when things don't go according to plan, it's easy to get down on ourselves, isn't it? But it encourages me to know that even a great man like Moses, he failed. Great men in the Bible like Joshua, the Apostle Paul, they had failures. So what do we learn from our failures? We're looking at, uh, at uh, Exodus chapter 2, starting at verse 11. And a little background, as we studied in the last chapter, Moses, uh, he was a Hebrew, right? Mm -hmm. Was he raised as a Hebrew? Oh. Sort of. Half and half. Yes, half and half. He was raised for several years by his own mom but he was the son of Pharaoh's daughter Pharaoh, Moses' mom had no choice she couldn't hide Moses the edict was that all the Hebrew babies were supposed to be cast into the river she trusted in God she made an ark to give the baby a chance to survive and boy did God did God reward her faith that ark went right to Pharaoh's daughter, and Moses' sister followed. Moses' mom was paid by Pharaoh's daughter to raise her own baby. Amen? Amen. Once Moses was old enough, he went to the palace. He was raised as part of the royal family, given the best education and training. Moses was, at this point, as we get here, a mighty man of valor part of the royal family, someone who's respected and revered. But Moses didn't let the fame, didn't let the comfort get him to forget his roots, did he? Oh. Moses knew that he was a Hebrew. And it affected him when he saw the persecution the Hebrews were going through. The Hebrews were beaten. They were slaves. The slavery they endured, if you go back and read in chapter 1, was specifically designed to stop their, them from thriving. Pharaoh wanted them to die in their work. He want, That's how harsh he tried to make it. Yep. This was bone-breaking, soul-crushing labor. Moses could have said, well, I'm glad I'm, I'm glad I'm the son of Pharaoh's daughter. I don't have to deal with that. But we don't see that, do we? In verse 11, we see, Now it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out to his brethren and looked at their burdens. He could have turned his head and said, I, I don't want any part of that. But not Moses. It bothered him. Moses, even before God called him, was Moses a man who cared about his people? Mm -hmm. Who was disturbed by the suffering of people? Yes, he was. Those were all good qualities. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked that, this way and that way. So he sees an injustice. And he needs to act, doesn't he? Yep. Is it good to enact, to act, when you see an injustice? And you feel you can do something? Hang on. Generally, you... yes. Yeah. Generally. Yeah. It's how you act. So he looked this way and that way. And when he saw no one... He spoke to the Egyptian and counseled him that uh, beating the Hebrews is wrong and he should go easier on them, right? Mm -mm. No. Wrong. No, that's not what he did. Moses, this great hero of the faith, he's not there yet. He killed the Egyptian mm -hmm. and hit him in the sand. So he's ready to try to start freeing the Hebrews, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Moses has this idea. He's the one man... Uh, Liberator crew. Starts with helping these two out. The next day, 
We read in verse 13, And when he went out the second day, behold, two, he two Hebrew men were fighting. And he said to the one who did the wrong, Why are you striking your companion? So he's trying to, he's trying to right all the wrongs by himself. I applaud Moses' eagerness to help his fellow Hebrews out. But he hasn't fought it through, has he? We read in verse 14, Then he said, Who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? So Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of this matter, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. So Moses is, uh, he wanted to do something about the plight of his fellow men. He took action, but it didn't work, did it? In the end, the Hebrews are still slaves, and now he's a wanted man. He has to flee his home. He can't do anything to help them from the land of Midian, can he? And he has to live in fear. What if Pharaoh and his men find me here? What if they come all the way here looking for me? He has to look over his shoulder. He's a wanted man. He's a fugitive now. Have you ever tried to do the right thing? And really screwed up and did it the wrong way? I think we all can say we have. There's another guy in the Bible who was trying to do the right thing and did it the wrong way. Let's turn to Joshua, chapter uh, 7. Does anyone know what Joshua was commanded to do by the Lord himself? Conquer the promised land. Conquer the promised land. So we, so uh, we read in verse 1, But the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed things. So the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. If you read in the chapter before, if you read in the chapter before or in other previous chapters, the Lord would often give Israel commands. Sometimes it would be, you can take the spoil. Sometimes you can't touch the spoil. The Lord had very specific instructions whenever they went in, whenever they conquered someone. They weren't just to do whatever they pleased, were they? That was far different than the the traditions of the tribes around there. If you were from one of the tribes around there, you always pillaged. Not so in the Lord's economy. So Joshua, in verse 2, is totally unawares of this. Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside beth -Avon, on the east side of Bethel, and spoke to them, saying, Go up and spy out the country. So the men went up and spied out Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not let all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and attack Ai. Do not weary all the people, because of the, all the people there, for the people of Ai are few. So about 3,000 men went up there from the people, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai struck down about 36 men and chased them yeah, and chased them from before the gate as far as Shabarim and struck them down on the descent. Therefore the hearts of the people melted and became like water. So wait a minute, weren't they commanded to go conquer? What's happening here? Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. He and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. Joshua is mourning right now. Moving on, in verse 7, And Joshua said, Alas, Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us? Oh, that we had been content and dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. Very quick to lose his uh, faith here, isn't he? Moving on. Oh Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns its back before its, his, before its enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear it and surround us and cut off your name from the face from the earth. 
then what will you do for your great name? So what do we see here that he didn't do? He didn't seek the Lord first. Yeah. Is there any time before the battle that Joshua prays? Not that we know of. The Bible usually is very meticulous for recording this. And most of these you see God gives a plan. You don't see it here. There's no prayer. There's no seeking counsel of the Lord. He just... He just says, okay, we'll send some spies. The spies say it should be easy. They don't even send their full contingent of troops because they think it's going to be a cakewalk. So he doesn't pray. They get cocky because they think, well, there's no way we're going to lose. Can we get that way sometimes? We need to ask ourselves some questions when we find ourselves failing. First off, have we consulted the Lord? Have we bothered to ask him at all? Because I guarantee you, if we haven't asked him, it's not going to go the way we planned. Granted, sometimes you can ask him and it doesn't go the way you planned, but if that happens, it's because the Lord has a better plan than what you have. And, and uh, in time, you'll see what the Lord is going to do through his plan. But oftentimes, it's because we haven't asked God, or we haven't repented our sins. It, Joshua was doing what God wanted him to do, but because he didn't pray, he wasn't in tune with the fact Israel was in sin, was he? All it took was one guy to derail all of Israel. I'm here to tell you today, all it takes is one person to derail an entire church. That's all it takes. All it takes is one person to derail an entire ministry. All it takes is one person to derail an entire family. Ask yourself, are you praying before you jump into battle? Are you asking the Lord for wisdom before you move forward with whatever you're doing? Did Moses pray? Before he killed that Egyptian? Guarantee you it didn't. More often than anything, we pray because we, we fail because we haven't prayed. Number two, we fail because we haven't confessed our sin. Because we have our secret sins in our heart like Achan had that no one knows about. And we're not willing to give them to the Lord. We're not even willing to acknowledge we have them sometimes. We make excuses on why it's justified. But oftentimes, that's why we fail. Because our sin is holding us back. Oh, how important it is for us to go to the Lord daily and confess our sins. How good are we at that? How strong are we at that? You know, God can't bless us if we're willing to let our sin bog us down. Is it any wonder we see the church in America failing when so much of the body of Christ winks at sin nowadays? How is God going to bless when the Bible says this is says uh, sexual immorality, sex outside of marriage is a sin, and we say, ah, it's okay. As long as you care about each other, it's fine. God's not going to bless God doesn't bless sin. When we fail in life, when our churches fail, when our communities fail, we need to be asking ourselves, have we prayed? And have I confessed my sins? Maybe it's not you who's confessed your sin. Pray that the Lord will work in your church. Pray that the Lord will work in your community. Pray that the Lord will work in your family. That whatever sin might be holding you back is confessed and dealt with. God can't work if we, well, he can, but he chooses not to work if we choose to work against him. He wants us to be united behind him, amen? Amen. And we ignore this so often. The first thing that happens in a church, there's failure, 
is most people point to the pastor or they point to some other leader. Maybe they point to the assistant pastor or the deacon or the elder. Not many people think, Lord, please, whatever sin is in our congregation, please root it out. But we should think about that more, shouldn't we? Not many people think when there's failure in our family, so many times they'll point the finger at the husband or the wife or the kid. Maybe we need to be thinking about, Lord, what sin is in our family? Lord, please root it out. The Lord's response in verse 10. So the Lord said to Joshua, Get up, why do you lie thus on your face? Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant which I commanded them. For they have even taken some of the accursed thing, and have both stolen and deceived, and they have also put it among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but have turned their backs before their enemies because they have become doomed to destruction. <coughs> Neither will I be with you any more unless you destroy the accursed thing from among you. Get up, sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves for tomorrow, because thus says the Lord God of Israel. There is an accursed thing in your midst. O Israel, you cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. <coughs> you know, Joshua, this whole theatrics, Why, God, why? God says, get up! You need to get your house in order. America, we want to see God bless this country again? We need to get our house in order. Stop embracing everything that is against God and start repenting. Amen? Amen. Amen. Christians, you want to see revival in this country? We need to get the accursed thing out from our midst. Amen? Amen. No more calling wrong right. Oh, it's 2019. We need to get with the times. No, we need to get with the Bible. Amen? Amen. That is why we're in the mess we're in in this country and in this world and in this church. Because we don't live in a bubble, do we? No. I want to encourage all of us here to ask ourselves, is there sin in our lives that's holding us back? It could be that maybe God is saying, keep moving forward, it's not time yet. But maybe you're here today and you're thinking, I have sin in my heart. Maybe you're watching on the internet and you're, see and you're seeing, why isn't my church growing? What's going wrong? Is there sin in your heart that you're not repenting of? Maybe you're holding your ministry back. This needs to be something we always do because sometimes we're not even aware of our sin. Amen? Amen? The human mind has a very strong capacity for self-deception. We need to be going before the Lord consistently. Lord, forgive me for my sins, even the ones I don't even know about. That's what Job did, didn't he? Yep. He prayed for himself. He prayed for his kids. That God would forgive them for the sins they don't know about. We need to understand that there's often reasons why we fail. And even if you're not the one who's taken of the accursed thing, you can still pray that God roots out that sin, can't you? We can still pray that God will convict the hearts of those among us. Because when you look at America, we look at the world, you look at the state of the American church, it's not what God has called it to be. When God's church is free from sin, we move from victory unto victory. Amen? Amen? We're not moving from victory unto victory. Because we've allowed too much sin in our camp. And all too often, when instead of praying and asking God for forgiveness, instead of asking God, is it me? Instead of asking God to humble our hearts so that we can see clearly what ails us, we pass the buck and blame someone else. In this case, Joshua was blaming God himself, wasn't he? Examine your hearts today. Oh, how much bloodshed could have been avoided if before going to Ai, Joshua would have prayed. 
Oh, how much problems could be avoided at your job, in your family, in your church, in our country. If we would just pray, ask for forgiveness from the Lord. Ask God to open our eyes if there's any sin that's holding us back. Ask God to open the eyes of our friends, our family, our loved ones, our fellow church members, if there's any sin that's holding them back. Oh, how much pain could be avoided if we would do that. Now, you know, the Lord was frustrated with Joshua, but you know what? He told him how to deal with it, didn't he? The Lord didn't just say, okay, you're through, Joshua. You're done. You failed once. You're off the team. You're out of the family. Praise God he doesn't do that. Amen? Amen. He told Joshua what he needed to do to get Israel right. And when we fail, that is not the end of the game. When we fail, that doesn't mean quit. That doesn't mean give up. That doesn't mean, oh, this country's done. The church is done. My family's done. I should get a divorce. My job is done. Time to quit. No. What we need to do is make things right, amen? amen. Starting with us. Asking God, is it me? Am I the reason? And if I am the reason, the solution isn't, I'm just going to quit. I'm, I'm, de I'm depressed. No, God isn't done with you, and you shouldn't be done with his work either. Amen? Amen? We need to repent. We need to say, Lord, I'm turning from my wickedness. I'm giving up the accursed thing. I'm not going to go through this entire passage because, because there's only so much time, but, and I want to get back to Moses, but Achan had ample opportunity to come forward and repent. But he didn't confess until uh, it was already too late. Until the Lord had already made it clear he was the one responsible. Don't wait until your sin has already found you out to repent. Because it won't go good for you. Repent now. Before that sin is time to destroy your life. Amen? Amen? Because when we allow sin to just linger and linger and linger, instead of going victory unto victory, it's failure unto failure. It will stack up. It will add up. You won't be happy. You won't be fulfilled. You will not be rejoicing. That sin will build up and it will weigh on you. Repent now. Don't wait till it's too late. That's what Achan did. He waited till it was too late. Till the gig was up. He should have repented the minute Joshua made that announcement. Amen? The Lord may have showed him mercy. But he didn't. Praise God. He wasn't done with Joshua. Joshua had a chance to fix things. And Joshua did. Moses, he, he sinned too. Moses didn't ask God for a game plan. God's plan wasn't to go and murder some, some guy. He didn't go to the Lord. He did it himself. He sinned. His sin was a sin of ignorance. He thought he was doing the right thing. And God showed mercy on him, did he not? Yeah. We move on into verse, uh, nine, into verse 19. We read, When Pharaoh heard of this matter, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. Look at how the Lord works here. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water. And they filled the troughs to, to water their father's flock. Then the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. So Moses had very quickly had an opportunity to turn around and do the right thing, didn't he? Moses could have given up. I'm done intervening. I screwed it up so badly, I quit. Moses didn't do that. God gave him another chance because failure does not mean God is done with you. God knows I'm going to screw up. And praise God, when I screw up, it's not the end of the road. 
He just wants me to grow. He wants me to get better. He wants me to understand that, yeah, I am a sinful human being, but God can do so much more for my life if I let him. And Moses very quickly had another opportunity to either stand up and do the right thing, and it would have been very easy for him, after how much it cost him the last time he tried to stand up and do the right thing and did it the wrong way, it would have been very easy for him to just say, nope, not doing it. But he stood up, he defended the defenseless, and this time he didn't kill him. <laughs> and when they came to Rio, their fathers, he said, how is it that you have come so soon today? And they said, An Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the shepherds. And he also drew enough water for us and watered their flock. So how do we see Moses handling his failure? He serves. He didn't just defend them, did he? He drew water for their flocks. He put himself out there. This is a lot different than today getting water for a flock. That was hard labor for someone he didn't even know. Moses did the right thing. He didn't wallow in his pity. He didn't just let himself, I'm a screw-up, that's all I'm good at is screwing up, I'm done for. That's what the devil wants you to do. He wants you to accept a new identity, the identity of the failure. He wants you to wallow in your failure, wallow in your depression. That's not what Moses did, amen? Instead, he helped them. He delivered them from the shepherds. I mean, that had to be... Moses had to fight off multiple opponents to protect them. He put his life on the line. At first we see him killing someone. Now we see him stepping into a battle that he could very much have died in. In the defense of people. We see him afterwards doing hard manual labor to help these women. And so we see, they tell their father about him. And verse 20, and so he said to his daughters, And where is he? Why is it that you have left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. The dad's like, where is he? Why didn't you bring him over here? He's rejoicing. He's grateful that this stranger, this total stranger, protected his daughter. Daughters. His daughters, yes. All seven. Yeah. So we read in verse 21 that Moses was content to live with the man. And he gave Zipporah, his daughter, to Moses, and she bore him a son. He called his name Gershom, for he said, I have been a stranger in a foreign land. So look at what a blessing comes out of this. Because he did the right thing. God blessed him, didn't he? He got a fa new family. Because he did the right thing. He didn't give up. He didn't wallow in, in failure. He stood up the first opportunity he had, and he did the right thing. Totally opposite. Before he was killing a guy. Now, he put himself on the line where he could have easily gotten killed. Fighting against multiple opponents by himself. Doing selfless labor. He didn't wallow in his self-pity. He rose up. Joshua, to his credit, once God said, get up, he got up, didn't he? Yep. And he got the accursed thing away from them. He followed the instructions of the Lord. All of us are going to fail. There will be a time all of us are the Achan in our midst. Every one of us. Because we're sinners. That's a natural uh, problem we have. I wish we didn't. But all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. What do you do after you fail? God doesn't want us to wallow in self-pity because that doesn't help us. That just gets us depressed. That just leads us further and further down the paths of sin, down the paths of pain. We don't wallow in self-pity. It's to pick yourself up. Get back in the fight. Don't do things the way you did last time because that didn't work. Do something good. Do something godly. Do something holy. Do things God's way. If you, if you screwed up because of your anger, do something like Moses did, selflessly. 
everything Moses did. With uh, everything Moses did with them was so selfless. Totally the opposite of what he did. With the Hebrews, he was setting himself up to be the deliverer. Now he's setting himself up to be what? The servant. God wasn't done with Moses. And when Moses had another chance, he didn't do things the same way he did before. God wasn't done with Joshua. And Joshua rose up and did it God's way instead of his way. Now we read on in verse 21, Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. Then the children of Israel groaned because of their bondage, and they cried out, and their cry came up to God because of the bondage. So God heard their groanings, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham and Isaac and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God acknowledged them. So we see a prelude to what's coming in the next chapter. Moses will get his chance to help deliver Israel, will he not? Mm -hmm. Amen. This time it's going to be God's way. Because Moses picked himself up. He didn't wallow in pity. He didn't wallow in failure. He didn't stay in that dark place. God's going to remember him. God is going to use him to do what he always what was on his heart, we desperately wanted. God is going to use him to deliver Israel. Wouldn't have happened if he hadn't got himself up, if he hadn't rose up, if he just wallowed in self-pity. I give up. Why am I going to help these people? Last time I helped people, look what I got. I got exiled. There's a lot of those shepherds there. It's I'm outnumbered. Why should I risk my skin for them? I'm just a failure anyways. I'll mess it up. Moses didn't do that. And he became someone, a vessel that God could use. Joshua led Israel to victory, did he not? Yeah. Wouldn't have happened if he would have just said, well, you know what, God? <clears throat> These guys died you talk about the accursed thing, let someone else handle it. I already failed. It's how we deal with our failure that leads us to the blessings God has later on. Moses learned from his failure, didn't he? He learned humility from his failure. In fact, he almost learned too much humility. It took quite a bit for him to even accept the mission God had because he had such a view that he was unworthy. Joshua learned. He never went to battle again without seeking the Lord's counsel. <laughs> Failure is a valuable teacher. I can think of most of the most important lessons I've learned in my life all came from my failures. I've learned far more from my failures than I've learned from my successes. You can rise up like these men did. You can learn the lessons of your failure. You can let your failure make you a stronger man. Look at the difference in Moses willing to lay down his life for strangers after his failure. He grew, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Joshua grew from his failure. And you can too. In fact, you can look back at your life if you deal with failure the right way. If you don't stay on the ground. If you give your life back to the Lord, if you repent of your sin, you could look back one day at your failure and say, thank God for my failure. Because my failure built me into a better man or woman of God. That's what happened with Moses. That's what happened with Joshua. And it can happen with you, too. That's what we need in our country. For us to learn from our failures instead of trying to do the same thing over and over and over again and expect different results. That's what we need in our churches. To learn from how we failed. Instead of trying to do the same thing over and over again and expect different results. That's what we need in our families. That's what we need in our workplaces. It starts with being humble. Being willing to ask God, is it me? 
where where is my responsibility in this? If we can do that, then then we're in a place where we're teachable. Instead of pointing the blame, oh, there's problems in the church, it's all Esther's fault. No, the first person I should be looking at is me. The first person. Likewise, we, you should all be looking at yourselves first. Doesn't mean you're the problem, but it means you should be humble enough to ask yourself, are you the problem? And how you can correct it. Because God can make something amazing out of your failures if you're willing to humble yourself and let him. I hope and pray that this has been a, a, both an encouragement to you and a conviction for you. Because if you're wallowing in self-pity, or if you're just so prideful that you're not willing to admit, hey, maybe I'm the fault, then God wants you to wake up. But if you're humble, if you're willing to ask yourself, Where's my fault in this? Then God, then you're in a teachable place. Remember, there's no shame in failing. I'll be the first to admit that I've failed many times, and I will fail many more times. If there's any one thing I can predict with certainty outside of the Lord's return, my failure is one of them. <laughs> <laughs> and if we're all honest with ourselves, we can all predict that too. Am I not right? Praise God, he loves failures. He doesn't give up on failures. If he gave up on failures, we'd all be gone. He would have given up on all of us. There's no shame in failing. Because the greatest men of God that ever lived failed. The greatest women of God that ever lived failed. And God didn't give up on them. He won't give up on you. Let him use your failure to mold you into a stronger man or woman of God today. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, I just thank you for your love for us, Lord, that you are a merciful, loving, forgiving God who does not cast us away because we fail. You have every right to, but you don't. Lord, I thank you so much that you love failures like me. I thank you so much you died for failures like me. I thank you so much that you rehabilitate failures like me so that we can do something great for your honor and glory. So that we can have life more abundant and free, Lord. That we don't have to wallow in failure. We don't have to wallow in our struggles. But we can rise above them. We can stand up with your strength. We can progress. We can become successes through you, Lord. Not through our own strength, but through you, Lord. So I pray that you would help us to be humble. That when things don't go according to plan, that instead of pointing the finger at the other guy, we'll ask ourselves. And we'll ask you, what, what part do I have in this? That we'll be humble enough to listen to what our part is, and that we'll be quick to repent of that failure. So that the teaching and the healing can begin, Lord so that you can make us stronger through our failures, Lord. Give us humility, Lord. Help us to not be quitters. Help us to understand our frailties and instead take joy in knowing that you knew, you know how much we screw up and you love us anyways and you don't give up on us anyway. I thank you for all the times you've built me back up after I've messed up, Lord. And I thank you that you have never given up on me, Lord. I pray that you give us humility and that you would build us up into something wonderful for your honor and your glory, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.